Hallo und willkommen auf meinem Kanal. I love to have you here and if you're new, I'm Stephanie and I make videos on topic of language learning. I love foreign languages and that's what this channel is dedicated to. I currently speak eight of them, learning a couple of more. And this master guide series is actually one that I plan to do for every language that I speak. It is a series that covers idiosyncrasies of the language, how I learned it, how I recommend that you learn it, what best tips and tricks are that I've learned about the language, picked up along the way, etc. Basically, all of the resources that you need to start learning a new language, what you should keep in mind, what advice I have to give, etc. So if you're interested to know that about the German language, then keep watching. If you like this series, please like and subscribe to this channel so you can see more videos along those lines. This one, today's, on German, is actually by a popular subscriber request. So a lot of you seem to want to know more about German, how to learn it, etc. So that is why this is going to be my third video in my Master Guide series, as there's been quite a lot of you that want me to do this. Don't forget, if you have any requests, um, feel free to drop them in the comments and I'll do my best. Now, every video in this series has the same setup and covers the same topics. So um, quite a few times, maybe I will give a very similar advice. For example, if I talk about the importance of input and reading and TV and when you're learning a new language, of course, that's going to be applicable to several languages, but I always tweak it to the language at hand. However, still, if there's only some parts you like to see and not others, because these master guides are huge and contain quite a lot of information, I have made chapters available for your convenience. So let's get started with German. German is first and foremost an Indo-European language, and more specifically, it is a Germanic language. I know, shocker. But to be more precise, it is a West Germanic language, which means that it is actually part of the same branch of the Germanic languages as Dutch and English are. And yes, English is also one, although it has absorbed so many Latin and French words, at its core, English is a Germanic language, which means that you as an English speaker, which I assume you are if you're watching this video, are actually well equipped to learn German. But there are some idiosyncrasies of the German language that make it a tougher cookie. And so I want to cover that in this video. But to begin with, I like to start always with why learn German. And there's always this disclaimer that I like to make that there's no such thing as a language that's not worth it to learn. I think that every language deserves to be learned. I think that you can have so many reasons you can have personal reasons to you, you can have objective reasons, such as number of speakers or opportunity, which I usually find are not as strong, but can be a good gateway reason to find a deeper connection with the language. Or you can have a mixture of those, you can have um, culture or art from that country that you like, anything, really. All of the statistics that I'm going to mention from now on, everything that I say, doesn't mean that that's why you should learn German. It just means here's some benefits you can expect if you learn German, but other than that, I truly and firmly believe every language deserves to be learned. That aside, let's get into the facts. Where is German spoken? Well, it is the official language naturally in Germany, but also in Austria, Switzerland, Liechtenstein and South Tyrol, which is the region of Italy. Funnily enough, yes, uh, there is a part of Italy that has German as its official language. It is in the north of the country, of course, bordering other German speakers, but I think it is a very curious point to make. It is also co-official in Namibia, Luxembourg and Belgium. And then there's a lot of other former German colonies where, no, it is not co-official, but there's significant populations of speakers there and also in many, many parts of the world where it is taught. Since German is one of the most widely taught languages in the world. In Europe, for example, along with English and French, those three are the most popular languages to be taught at schools. Certainly it is huge, especially in Eastern Europe where I come from. And a lot of countries actually in Europe as it is an official language of the European Union, a lot of countries actually teach that in school. And it is quite, quite popular here. Of course, it is also popular on other continents. They, it is one of the most widely taught languages. And that is for a good reason, because it is the second most spoken Germanic language after English. Not only that, but one tenth of all books in the world were written in German. And it is the second most common scientific language. German is huge in the world of science. And so if you are a scientist of any kind, chances are you have come across it quite a lot. It is one of the most common languages when it comes to scientific journals and papers and all of the research that's going on and that's happening in German is oftentimes not translated to English. And so there's quite a lot of literature that you'll not be able to access if you're a scientist and you don't speak German. So it is quite a big deal in that world and also in general in many disciplines related to science such as engineering 
of course, um, German is an economic powerhouse, so it is also a language that is quite, quite important in the business world. And Germany in general, for that reason, is one of the most popular countries to immigrate to. That is why, although there's 95 million native speakers, there's also 80 to 85 million second language speakers of German. And it is curious to know that not only are so many people all over the world studying German, but also we actually have here in Europe more native German speakers than English, French or Spanish speakers, which is fascinating. Another reason for you to study German could be the language's culture and everything that it entails because there's so many great minds in the world of science, of literature, of philosophy, of music and other types of art. It truly, it is um, a marvelous world to explore to the power of the German language, for example, Bach, Mozart, Wagner, or Freud, Nietzsche, Einstein, Kant, Goethe, etc, etc. So many great thinkers and so much culture to explore and just so many famous names, names that are now household names that actually come from the German speaking world. So it is a language with quite a strong cultural significance, scientific significance, economic significance, and just quite a few speakers to let you tap into all of those opportunities and to, to let you explore all of those areas. And of course, if you study German and you're also interested in studying multiple languages as well beyond German, then you'd be happy to know that knowing German is going to help you quite a lot in terms of studying other Germanic languages. And yes, I did mention English is a Germanic language, of course, but I feel like if you know German as well, that would be a very nice bridge to be able to pick up some other Germanic languages like Dutch or perhaps the Northern Germanic family. Since I feel like English, so much of its vocabulary is simply Romance, that with German you get a little bit of that exposure to more Germanic-based vocabulary, if that makes sense, which in turn can help you learn other Germanic languages better than if you simply knew English only. So that is a little bit of a side benefit for all the language lovers out there. How did I learn German? I am still learning German. This is a language that I started learning at school when I was about 11, I believe, or 12. I think 11. It was introduced as the second foreign language that I ever learned after English, but I didn't have as many hours, nearly as many hours of instruction either in middle school or in high school, nowhere near the number of hours I had in English. And I overall learned so much from learning German because I did everything wrong. And it was a great learning experience. You know, it was in stark contrast to what I did with learning Spanish by myself because it wasn't available at school. And I learned so many things about how to learn languages. And that really kickstarted the whole polyglot thing for me because that's when I realized how to learn. And German, I'm so grateful for that bad experience really because it taught me so many things about what not to do with language learning. And so I really wanna go deeper in this, in this master guide on how I learned it so that you know what mistakes to avoid. And I think it's a great experience to share our mistakes with each other just so that we know what to avoid. And I think it's in general, whatever language you're learning, please don't do the things I did with German. So here's the thing, I studied it at school only and I never really studied it much outside of school. So I didn't take learning into my own hands. And I think that outside of the classroom, that's where real language learning happens. I didn't have that experience with English because English was so much more intense in the classroom. We had so many more hours, but I also did so much more work outside of the classroom because you know, if English is your main foreign language and you're focused on that at school, you want to do well in it. And I did a lot of work outside of school in terms of exposure to um, the culture of Anglo-Saxon countries and just exposure to a lot of works from those countries, be it literature or music or TV shows and movies, etc. So I did a lot of consumption of content in English and in German, I didn't do that. I just followed my textbooks, which by the way, I haven't been able to find. I'm not sure I have them anymore, but in general, I don't like the textbooks that are used um, in language learning classes. They depend so much on a teacher. You're not able to be independent. I do like intro books. I've mentioned it, you know, those self-paced books where you can pick up from um, your favorite bookstore and just use to learn a language like ASIM, a living language, etc. So those I like and I use, but the ones that are actually used in school classes, I do not like. And I've commented on that many times and I've commented how I don't like the approach at schools at all. What I do have is a lot of the reference books and stuff that I bought for German back when I was in school. And I want to show you that. All right, this Bulgarian German dictionary, pretty self-explanatory. I don't think you need a dictionary these days. Um, I really think that, you know, it's much better to just use online dictionaries or Google Lens to kind of scan across a page if you have way too many unknown words. Uh, but yeah, 
So that is one thing that I have and that I don't think that you need a lot. And I think that we need to be very careful with the usage of dictionaries in language learning, especially when consuming input. I'm going to pop up my video on the topic of reading on the screen somewhere so that you know uh, what to do with the known words when you come across them. But I just wanted to show you that dictionary to tell you not to overuse dictionaries. And if you want to learn more, go in my reading video to figure that out and why I believe it. But moving on, another thing like this little phrase book that just gives you a bunch of phrases to use in German out of context, out of everything, um, just phrase book garbage this little grammar book which is basically i think also garbage simply because it has these charts and stuff like that just like a lot of look at that it's um you know forms of the verbs and how you form um, different tenses and then how you use different cases and what endings but it is none of it is explanatory to kind of scratch your curiosity itch which is a good function of grammar i think no this is all just charts to memorize endings to memorize forms of the verb garbage so i used a lot of that stuff that was not necessary let me show you the crowning moments so this book is in Bulgarian and I will translate the back of the book, which will tell you what this is about. So it's saying that it's about direction in German, which is defined as the ability of a verb, an adjective, etc., etc. They list a whole bunch of um, grammatical terms here to define the case of a dependent on it word in a sentence, as well as the function of the verb to require a certain proposition with a certain case. And so they're going to say that what you should do with this is that you should study them together as in memorize them. Um, and that is what, yeah, that is the book I bought. L look at that. It has all of these verbs, like what preposition, what case they go to and their dictionary definition. And what I'm supposed to memorize 200 plus pages. That's how I learned German. I mean, seriously, I wish somebody had told me back then that classes in school and these books are not the way. And thankfully, I got much smarter as the years passed because through my experience with learning Spanish, I realized what I should be doing. But initially, no, I made these mistakes of buying these like charts and dictionaries and things that tell you like what verb goes with what case and then remembering the case endings and then looking at those grammar tables and charts and stuff like that and thinking that that is going to help me. That type of rote memorization doesn't help to learn a language. All that does is make you extremely frustrated with the process, which is why I didn't like learning German when I was in school, because it was just so frustrating just remembering these endings and just following in that grammatical hole. And I'm a person that loves grammar, so, you know, because I like to understand what things mean, but this, this kind of memorization, just please don't do it. I know that German seems like a super tough language. We all know what Mark Twain said about it. We all know, you know, how many cases it has and how many articles it has, etc. But do not focus on those things. That is not how you learn those things. You don't need to memorize how the word name, for example, name, how it changes through all genders and through all declensions, etc. And how adjectives change in front of it. Just forget this memorization. Just forget all of those books that I just showed you. I will list much, much better options in the description below. So here's when I started taking German learning into my own hands. So this was actually when I was in the US and I wasn't studying German there. And I picked up this advanced German book. Again, it's a self-study book, so that's great for me. There's some parts of it that I like, there's some parts of it that I don't, but overall I think it's a much better book because it gives you dialogues, it gives you input, and it has like short grammar notes that are all about explaining why certain things happen, not about like memorizing it. So I think that that is good using things like that. What I've also done is I've turned German into my Netflix language. I have listened to quite a lot of audio in German in that way and also watched some YouTube videos over on the Easy German channel. As you know, I absolutely love easy languages and I am sorry if you're tired of hearing me speak about that. There's another book that I used, again, like self-teaching book with dialogues with a lot of real world input. And again, those books are, the first one I actually think I can list. The second one is uh, a Bulgarian book. I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to find it from an international audience, but I promise I am going to list good introductory books in the description below. What resources do I recommend that you use to learn German? 
I recommend in general starting with an intro book. I think that is an amazing um, way to start. As I was mentioning, the ones I showed you or the ones that I'm going to list in the description, they are amazing to get a start on the language. It doesn't matter which book. In fact, you can use several. Go over the material once with one book, then go over the material a second time with another book. Just keep it novel, keep it fresh, not very repetitive to kind of go through the same book twice. So I think that that is a great approach for German especially because there are just so many different nuances of the language that we're going to go over that are quite different from the way that English works, which I think it could be very useful to get over that basic information from a couple of intro books before you move on to other stuff. That being said, YouTube channels are also pretty cool. My beloved Easy German that I mentioned, but also a few other ones that I found that I think are going to be super useful for you. And they will be linked in the description as well. Those are channels that I plan to use myself to improve my German because I am still not fluent in German and I'm still working on that. So this is actually a little bit of my own study plan that I will be using a lot of those YouTube channels to learn German. And so that's why I'm listing them because I think that truly learning through YouTube channels can be an amazing way to do that. And once you're a little bit more advanced, you can actually use YouTube channels or any topic that you like. So the ones that I have linked are ones dedicated to learning German. Oftentimes they have subtitles, etc. But really, once you're about the intermediate level, you can just use any channel from the German speaking world on any topic. It does not have to be geared towards speaking German. It can just simply be about um, somebody from a German speaking country just speaking about some topic that you really like. The way that a lot of people do that is they create a separate profile so a separate account for that language so that the algorithm, once it sees that you're watching stuff in that language, it can feed you stuff in that language on your separate account. Um, that's great. If you're learning many languages, you might need one too many accounts, but just putting it out as a suggestion out there, it can be super um, useful for the later stages of language learning. Because once you're past the point of having the, the grasp the basics, you can actually enjoy those channels that are on topics that you care about. Same thing with podcasts. You can start with ones dedicated to learning German, like news in slow German, or for example, um, the Easy German podcast or any other language learning podcast. You can use that. But then once you know a bit more, you can simply pick podcast that is in the German language and you can use that. The way that I do it is actually through CastBox. I think that CastBox has the best filtering by language. Unfortunately, you cannot do that on many podcast services unless you change your country. You can't really get local content. But whatever podcast service you prefer to use, I think that CastBox is amazing for browsing. That is what I personally use. And I look for different podcasts in different languages. They have this great filtering feature that appears in settings. It's amazing. So you can use that to find podcasts in German. As always, when it comes to resources, I'm going to link it in the description so that you know what you can use. But also something that is also very good, and I've mentioned it in other videos of mine, is Language Reactor, which you can use to browse Netflix's catalog But when it comes to finding TV shows and movies that have their audio in German. I think dubbing is not amazing, but it certainly works. If you want to watch an American TV show dubbed in German, for example, or a Spanish TV show dubbed in German, whatever it is, if you want local German content, you can either use the VPN, as the one I link in the description below, or you can, for example, just find one of the original content that many streaming platforms right now are doing when it comes to content in German. There's more and more of it nowadays. One that I have heard quite a lot in terms of recommendations is the show Dark. I haven't seen it personally, so I cannot vouch for it like I vouch for Casa de Papel in the Spanish video, but it is one that I've heard a lot of compliments about from many people and it's one show that I plan to watch. So let me know if it's good actually in the comments below so I know whether you also agree if you happen to have seen it. Another wonderful resource to use are books and I'm going to show you two of the ones that I have used. One that is basically a fact book of like little snippets of facts, quite cute. Another one that I like is this one on Viking mythology. And in general, I always recommend in my videos to pick a book on a topic that you like, something that you're personally passionate about, you know, a trivia book or a mythology book. Those are interesting things for me. Um, for you, it might be a cooking book or it might be something um, about football or history or pottery, whatever your interests are. It's a really great way to read that in a foreign language because in that way, you're actually going to be able to pick up the language much faster because you're engaging on an emotional level. Now, when it comes to fiction, of course, one must be careful. And I mentioned that as well in other videos because at the end of the day, fiction contains very flowery language that can be super tricky. So only the fiction if you're advanced. Otherwise, I think there's quite a big chance of you getting bored 
and or <laughs> discouraged. So in general, I would say that nonfiction is better, but um, you know, do what works best for you. If you really want to do fiction and that's your motivation, then do it. Just be careful because know that in fiction, quite a lot of times, what is being used is a lot of tenses that nobody uses, a lot of constructions and cases that nobody uses in spoken German, a lot of words that are nowhere to be found in the language on the streets. So that is why I'm always a bit cautious with fiction. Now I have to mention German music and I don't actually listen to German music, but I know many people that actually have uh, praised quite a lot German rock music, German metal music. So I don't know much about that um, as I'm into different types of music. But of course, I really suggest using music to learn a language. And if you do like that type of music, then there's many great bands that come out of the German speaking world. And I think it could be great, a great way to learn, truly, because when it comes to music, it engages with our emotions so much, which really, really helps with the language sticking in the brain. So give it a go, um, sing out loud. That's a great shadowing technique, but also you're going to pick up a lot of words, a lot of expressions, a lot of colloquial language, which is great in stark contrast to the fiction that I was just talking about, because when it comes to music, usually the lyrics are much closer to the way that people actually speak. And then, of course, we remember songs almost forever, right? Don't we all have songs from our childhood that we remember super well? We do. So give it a go. It's certainly a method that I've used to great results with other languages. As I said, not really, I don't really know much about German music, but when it comes to other languages, boy, have I used this technique. It's super effective. Try language learning with music. Another great way to learn German is with people. And you're in great luck here because as I mentioned, it's a language that's quite spoken around the world. There's many German speaking communities in many countries. It's quite widespread. And so it's not that difficult to find German speakers out there and to practice with them. So I advise you to do that. If you don't have the opportunity to travel, that's fine. Uh, in many cities, there are German speakers. If there's not, amazing connectivity of the internet allows us to get in touch with such people. So that is a wonderful way to practice your German, to learn new expressions, etc. So take advantage of that. And of course, when you travel, always, always take advantage of that. Whenever I travel to a foreign country, if I'm learning their language, I always use it. Even if it is just to order a coffee, it's great to practice. It is so wonderful because sometimes you even say one word and immediately they know you're a foreigner and they tell you a little bit about your pronunciation and you realize how you can fix that. You connect to people on a much deeper level. You learn new words, you learn new expressions, you get to practice your own ability of producing good output in German. So I always say whenever you travel, don't be afraid to make mistakes and practice as much as you can, even if you don't generally practice with native speakers, even if you ignore my previous tip because you're quite introverted, for example, when you travel, please make sure to speak the language because it's a really great opportunity, one that should not be wasted. Watching or reading or listening to the news in German is also another great option because most of us like to keep informed, most of us get some sort of news on a daily basis and so why do it in your native language when you can do it in another language and kind of kill two birds with one stone. This is great if you don't have that much time. There's quite a lot of news sources in the German-speaking world. Deutsche Welle is one that is quite famous, quite popular, but there's also um, quite a few others that you can come across. And I really recommend this as a strategy to learn any language. News are also much more accessible if you're a beginner or lower intermediate student, because then there's a lot of options for you. There's a lot of short articles you can read. So it's not as overwhelming as a book. Uh, the language is usually simpler and it can be a great gateway into getting exposed to written content or audio or video content in German before jumping to bigger stuff like books and movies and the usual, which we associate with a bit higher levels. So news can be small snippets of new information, which is why I think that it is a good place to start. And then there's, of course, a bit more specific ways if you are interested in certain fields. As I mentioned, German is the second biggest scientific language in the world. So if you're a scientist, that can be a great motivation to stay abreast of your field, to keep up with the new developments. And then you can also learn German that way, for example, through reading the newest research papers in your field, because so many of them are written in German, not just in science, actually, a lot of times in academic journals, German is huge. I like to read a lot of academic journals on historical topics. I love ancient history, so I read quite a lot on that. There's so many journals that are in German, even in um, ancient history. So it doesn't have to be science, just a lot of the academic world is in German. And so if you're in school or um, if you like to read academic journals for fun sometimes, as it happens with me in ancient Greece, um, you can certainly find so much good information out there in German. And I think that is a good thing to call out if you're interested in that. But also another one is 
football or soccer, depending where you are in the world and what you call that sport. So Germany is huge in that. And chances are it is not that difficult to find German language coverage of your favorite teams, your favorite games. And I think that watching the game in German can also help you quite a lot. It's a very emotional sport, right? It gives you the edge of the seat. And so combining that again, a little bit like music with, you know, hearing German, it can really help it stick. So I think you don't necessarily only need to watch movies or like listen to music, whatever. You can also watch football slash soccer games in German. Germany is huge in that. And I think it's going to be very useful for your skills in terms of getting real world exposure to how the language is actually spoken because those sports commentators, they actually use language that is quite relevant to the way the language is spoken on the streets. Now let's dive into some of the idiosyncrasies of the German language. As you know, German uses the Latin alphabet as well, just like English does. However, there are some notable differences to point out when it comes to pronunciation and spelling and even extra letters. So German is actually quite straightforward to read. It is not like French where you know half of the letters are not pronounced. There are some rules that you need to learn about how certain letters are pronounced and that's about it. It's not that complicated. It's really easy to learn to read German. For example, you need to know that CH is not like, you know, you pronounce it in chair in English, but it's a H sound. So like machen, etc. And the H is sometimes not pronounced, but it elongates the vowel sound. There's just a few rules, a few rules that tell you how to read German words. Reading in German really follows patterns. It follows rules. There's barely any exceptions. It is not difficult to learn and it is nowhere near as difficult as learning to read in English or in French, where you never know exactly how a certain letter is going to be pronounced and it changes a thousand times. In German, there's rules and it makes it really easy to read. And don't fret when you see those letters um, actually come up because at the end of the day, they're just other letters. You know, for example, the umlaut or that sign that you see about those vowels that you see on the screen, that just means that the vowel is pronounced slightly differently than normal. And it has, again, a very specific sound that doesn't really change, that is always the same, that you never really have to think about. The only changes in sounds are if there's like another letter next to it and you can learn those rules and you can know. Um, those sounds can be a bit tricky to make. I still struggle with the ö sound. You know, it's not very easy. I get it. But you know, you don't have to be perfect with your accent. You just need to pronounce correctly. And that letter is actually not scary though. It's simply a double S. That's it. And actually many times you can replace it with a double S, especially online. Now I'd be amiss if I didn't mention, of course, the German capitalizes their nouns. That is a very important part of how things are spelled. You just need to get used to that. It's not a big deal. There's not much to it. I don't know why they do it, but at the end of the day, they do it. You just learn, okay, it's a noun. It has to be capitalized. That's it. So again, not much there when it comes to pronunciation, when it comes to spelling. It is quite straightforward. And as long as you know the rules and there are not that many of them, you're going to be fine. Here's where German can get a bit tricky, unfortunately. That is compound words. German has quite a few of those, just like agglutinative and they stick words together and it kind of becomes one huge word sometimes, such as the one that you see on the screen. I'm not even going to attempt to read that. It's it's one of the, my least favorite things about the German language, I'm going to admit, but it is something that you're going to have to get used to. That's just the way it is. So how does it work? For example, in English, if you would say tree house, that's usually two separate words, but in German, they form one mega word. So again, it's like the one that you just saw, but also when it comes to tree house, that is much easier. It's just bomb house, simple and nice, but still you just kind of stick the two words together in a way that doesn't happen in English. Or take the word group and price. Group and, group and price which yes, it means price, but again, you stick them together. And German loves doing that. To take another word, Aktiengesellschaft, again, it becomes long, it becomes a bit more difficult to use than it is in English. What can you do? As long as we don't encounter too many, of, like the huge one that I showed you before, we're gonna be fine. But in general, yes, German has a lot of compound words. Yes, there's something to get used to. And a lot of the times it makes it a bit easier because for example, for many words, you don't actually need to have an entirely new word. You can just stick to words that you already know together and that's how you form a new word. So that can make it even, yeah, first it can be a bit frustrating, but then you're like, oh, this seems to be easier than English. Why? Because you don't actually need to borrow from Greek and Latin to make new words like English often does. Uh, but you can just stick to words that already exist in the German language together and make a new word. So 
yeah, compound words are something that I have a little bit of a love and hate relationship with, but it's something that is important for you to know if you're a German learner, to keep an eye out, to make sure that you notice those patterns so that you're able to form those words more naturally and to know what is a real word and what isn't, because that can be a danger sometimes as well. German is a gendered language. Yeah, that can be a bit tricky if you're not used to gender in your native language. For me, it's also tricky, although my native language has three genders, as does German. So in German, the three genders are represented by three definite articles, der, die, and das. And those articles, they change depending on the case. And we're going to get into cases in just a little bit, but every single word has a gender. And articles are going to change according to the gender. So what do you do? So I actually think that the rules can be useful here because a lot of the times certain endings mean a certain gender in German. For example, for feminine nouns, nouns that end in ung, height and shaft are usually feminine. Sometimes there's no rules. For example, nouns that end in er or er, those can be any of the three genders. So you don't really know always. There's some exceptions. Some endings are very common for certain gender than others, can be across all genders and you don't really know. And so there are some rules that you can look up. A lot of the times people say, you should memorize each new noun that you learn with the word. You know I don't encourage memorization of words as in rote memorization of isolated words and just like going through a word list. You know I'm all against that. You know I'm against flashcards, etc. So if you're new to my channel, yeah, I am against that. and. I am because I think that words out of context, they mean nothing, as also gender out of context means nothing. So you're not going to learn that gender the way that usually you're advised to learn it, just like learn it with the word and you're going to be great. I don't think so. I don't think that you're going to be great. I think it's going to be difficult. So what's happened to many German learners when they try to do that, including to me, by the way, is to get super frustrated. But I think it's much better to look up the common endings for certain genders. You can do that because it helps you notice if you have gender stick in the head somehow but um, that's about it. That's the only thing I advise. Some common endings. You know that nouns in Unk are always going to be feminine. Great. That's amazing. That can help, but don't try to memorize each noun with its own gender. That's the advice I got at school, and I think it's wrong because it doesn't help you speak at the end of the day. It just makes you super frustrated because guess what? You are not a computer. You're not going to be able to memorize a dictionary. But that aside, how do you learn? I, well, as always, I will encourage learning in context. And I think it's very easy. Actually, a lot of times it's very easy to recognize when a noun is feminine and when it's not. At least for me, it's always easy to say if a noun is feminine or not. German feminine nouns are just it's really easy to recognize when they're feminine just because of their endings and just, it's just like very straightforward. A lot of the times there's very rarely that you're not going to know when a noun is feminine. I don't know why, it's just a bit easier to recognize. But then once I know a noun is not feminine, is it masculine or is it neuter? I don't know. It's really difficult sometimes. So, and memorizing doesn't help me solve that problem. So what I do a lot of the times is I recommend get a lot of exposure and you're going to start picking up the gender of words and when to use it naturally. You're going to be able to use the correct articles, the correct adjectives, etc. Once you get a lot of exposure, it is not about trying to remember the article of every word because that doesn't flow out naturally in a sentence. So do a lot of exposure and with time, you're going to pick up the gender gender of words naturally. And if you make a mistake, it's not a big deal because we all make mistakes in language learning. That's something we should be very comfortable with. Something else that scares quite a lot of speakers when it comes to German is the use of cases, but there's only four in the German language. So I think that it's not that big of a deal because in many other languages you have more. There's some languages with so many like Finnish or Hungarian. And German is actually one of the languages with the fewest cases. And one of those cases, the genitive, is barely used in everyday speech. So if you want to be able to write proper German and like very formal statements or papers or anything like that, then maybe you need to know the genitive. But actually, I think that if you're interested in just communicating in German as in everyday speech, you don't necessarily need to know the genitive. So that really makes it three cases. And really one of them is the nominative, which is kind of like the base case. So really it's only two that you need to worry about and distinguish which are the accusative and the dative. When it comes to gender and when it comes to case, there's those huge tables of like how each noun and adjective and article inflects according to gender and case and number. And it's just this huge memorization thing, which we already saw right here, like all of these charts. 
don't fall for that trap that I did when I was, I don't know, 12. Do not fall for it. Do not try to memorize. Same thing as with gender. Do not try to memorize case endings. You can read about when a certain case is used and when another is. If you're interested, simply as a way to just know more, to just realize why this noun is changing. It can be helpful sometimes to know, but don't try to memorize the endings because at the end of the day, it's not going to help. Again, as with gender, the cure is one and the same. It is a lot of exposure so that you see how nouns change and you kind of start to mimic that intuitively, naturally, the way that children learn languages through lots and lots of input, as opposed to Again, this piece of garbage. Something else that I think that you should pick up quite a lot through context as opposed to trying to memorize it is the plural in German because it is not as simple as in English. You don't simply add an S. There's quite a few endings that can be used to make the plural in German, which are gonna pop up on the screen. And um, really it depends on the word. There's some rules you can follow. Most of the time it's difficult to know what's gonna happen, what, how a word is gonna form its plural. So truly um, it comes down to, to lots of input. In general, it's not that difficult, but I think that it still is trickier than in English. So a lot of the times it's about getting a lot of that input. And I think the plural comes naturally and easily it comes more easily than gender in my opinion so it is not something to worry about but it might be useful before you start getting lots of German input to simply develop that ability to notice those endings by just reading a little bit about them and seeing what they're about so that you are better prepared with those endings later on when you encounter them in your reading and you know watching youtube videos whatever you can be much more receptive to them and open to them if you've kind of seen them a little bit once before so i'd recommend to just get a head start on that and see the different endings in german and what words they're commonly used with now on to the last point which is german verbs german verbs can be quite daunting to anybody that starts to learn german which is why I want to cover them so that you know what to expect. You can be prepared when you're starting to learn German. Here's the thing. German verb placement can be tricky because sometimes you see the subject verb object structure as it is in English and you think this is quite easy. But then other times you see the verb jump around all over the sentence, most often at the end, and you're like, why? Well, at the end of the day, really, the second concept in a German sentence should be the verb. I love this role and that is why I'm mentioning it here in this video because I think it simplifies so much about German, so much about the mystery of German verbs and how they behave and why do they jump around, etc. I think this is a super useful concept. Let's see some examples. Ich möchte einen Computer kaufen. As you see, the verb möchte is the second place right after the subject. That is very simple and it is just like in English. I want to buy a computer. Let's take for example this sentence. Wenn du Lust hast, kannst du mit uns kommen. So the first clause is the first thing here. So when you want to, when you feel like it, you can come with us. So that whole part, when you feel like it, when you want to, that is the first part here. And then what is the rule? Then it needs to be followed by a verb. So kannst du. So it's not really a question. You see that inversion of verb and subject, which in many languages can mean as a question. It's not really a question. It is simply about following that rule. A lot of the times, actually, German verbs are going to go to the end of the sentence. But that usually happens when they're in different clause in a sentence. So not in the main one. Take a look at this. Er möchte ein Auto kaufen, wenn er Geld hat. So see, hat is the verb to have, um, conjugated in the third person. And it goes to the end of the sentence. You see that the verb möchten, again, it's um, conjugated in the third person and it's right after er or he. And so it just follows this super simple structure as in English. But then when you have the explanation about when is he going to buy a new car when he has some money, then that explanatory part of the sentence usually keeps the verb at the end. And so that's why you see a lot of those German verbs that come at the end of a sentence and you have all of these words that are so many nouns and adjectives and adverbs right there in the middle and they're just you're just waiting for the verb up right until the very end. That's why interpretation in German is actually super hard. And if you're a German interpreter, I commend you because this is really a very tough thing to do, to just keep all that information in your mind and just wait for the verb to come because then you would need to translate the opposite way. You need to say the verb first and then the other information in most languages. Let's take another example. Ruf mich an, 
فرض و پروبلمه هست Again, we, are, we have this subordinate clause that's explaining When should I call you? Oh, when I have problems, okay. And it simply goes to the end of the sentence many times, especially when there's like another verb or like verb particle, or like with model verbs, with certain tenses, the formation of those tenses, the main verb just goes to the end of the sentence. And so I think it's good to know a little bit of those rules that I told you about, about, you know, how the second thing has to be the verb or how, you know, the verb can go to the end of the sentence when you're actually, it's in a subordinate clause, etc. But really the most important thing in this case is to just get a lot of German input because then you get this natural feeling about when to use it. And I think this is one of the easiest things about German. Yes, although that sounds super weird, actually, the way that these sentences are structured, it's really, it comes very quickly to you. Once you get some German input, that is one of the first things that you start to do automatically, just putting the verb at the end of the sentence, putting, inverting the verb, all of those things, they come very easily and they come much more quickly through input than cases or articles, like declension, etc., or like what um, gender a word is, that can, that is actually, that is still tough for me. But the order of verbs, that actually comes really quickly. It's surprising how quickly this will feel natural to you. This is a very input-based thing, and I think it will come much faster than for example, your notion for what is feminine, what is masculine, and what is neuter. I think that this input will give it to you much more quickly. Input will solidify word order for you much more quickly than it will solidify other points of grammar. So it is not as scary. I really want to use this video to tell you that this thing that you find so scary about ver German verbs is really not. And I think that's important to keep in mind because it keeps you from freaking out over German. Something similar that is also something that you can get used to quite quickly is separable of verbs. So those are verbs that are usually, they have their own normal form with no prefixes, but then they also have this form with a prefix. So machen is to, to make, to do, and then zu machen is to close something. So obviously zu just gives the word an entirely different meaning, and that happens with many, many German verbs. And usually that particle is totally separable and moves around in the sentence. For example, mach die Tür zu, close the door. You see that zu kind of jumped at the end of the sentence and that is really common in German. And many verbs do it. And again, it's something that seems scary in the beginning, but it is easy to get used to. Um, what is difficult is to know the meaning of those verbs, the different meaning that the particles impart because one verb can have so many different meanings depending on what particle you put in front of it and for that that is of course vocabulary learning basically which really is best done through input but i think that also when it comes to using those verbs that is much easier to get used to, to just you know stick that particle at the end of the sentence that is something that's going to come to you quite quickly with very little input and uh, really remembering all the different meanings is what, it's what's going to come through exposure, but it's going to come a bit slower. So again, not to worry about this. You are going to be able to separate those verbs very quickly. Knowing their meaning is going to take some time, but again, keep reading, keep listening, keep watching videos, and you are going to get there. And let's talk about our conjunctive or subjunctive. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not just the Romance languages that have it. German has it too. And trust me, I'm a person that used to hate the subjunctive, but I've become super used to this with learning a lot of languages you encounter in so many. And yeah, it's just a thing that is necessary. So how does it work in German? There's two types. Type one is a type that's used mostly in indirect speech. So whenever you're saying what somebody else said, and you're just kind of retelling that. And part two is actually used in a lot of ways, a little bit similar to the Romance languages in terms of expressing wishes, desires, etc. But it's also used in terms of expressing theories or, for example, forming the conditional, forming polite phrases. So I really think that what you should focus on and pay attention to and learn is really the second form of the subjunctive, the one that is used for polite phrases, for wishes, etc. Because the first form of the subjunctive, which is used basically mostly in news. You don't really use it in everyday speech. People don't use it when they're retelling events in everyday speech. It's mostly used in formal news coverage. So I would not bother with it at all. And I actually don't bother with it at all. I just want to bother with the second form of the subjunctive because you actually need it. And listen, unless you're going to sit a language exam in German, I don't see the point in learning something that you're never going to use, that you simply don't need. The unfortunate part is it has a present and a past form and you kind of got to learn those. But at the end of the day, actually, I don't think it's a very 
very difficult in German because it's just it's common in a lot of everyday phrases and you kind of learn to pick it up from that. What do I mean? For example, the phrase ich hätte gerne, I would like, which you would use, I don't know, in a restaurant or something. It's one of the first phrases that you learn in German. It's super common and the subjunctive is used in quite a lot of super common phrases. And that really helps you pick it up subconsciously. And especially in those phrases that you would mostly be using it in, you already kind of know it through that process of just simply learning the phrase through context. So you don't necessarily need to fret over the different conjugations of the subjunctive and all of that stuff. It's truly not a big deal. And that is what I love about the German subjunctive, that it really, even from the beginning, you can learn to use some of those phrases. They're set kind of, they're very common, and that can help you pick up the subjunctive without necessarily learning the finer grammar points too much. So as always, simply pay attention to it when you come across it in books, see whenever a verb is kind of changed and you don't think it's normal anymore, that usually means it's a subjunctive. And so you can notice that form and that's going to help you learn it. But really, it is used quite a lot in German, the second form of a subjunctive, so pay attention to that and completely ignore the first. That would be my advice. As I said, unless you're sitting a German fluency exam. And to go out on the grammar note, numbers in German are actually something that some learners are concerned about, but I just don't think it's that huge of a deal. Uh, for example, 55, which would be the equivalent of saying in English 5 and 50 instead of 55. So it's really this little change that actually in the beginning it's quite annoying, but then a little bit of time passes and then you do it naturally with saying the ones place first. I know it can be frustrating, but it is not. If you haven't seen my French video, then you know what the pain numbers are in French and you know, that can really put things into perspective and make you feel better about German numbers. So what variety of German should you learn? If you've seen my other videos, you probably know my opinion that variety doesn't matter as much. And I usually say that about other languages, but I cannot say that about German. There's so many varieties in German there and they are quite different from each other. For example, Hochdeutsch is the standard form of German. It means high German versus low German or versus different regional dialects such as Swiss German or Austrian German. They're quite different. Now, high German does not mean high as in it's better than the others. That name comes from simply the fact that there was a sound shift that took place in areas of high elevation, mountainous areas of Germany, which is where this name comes from, as opposed to areas of low elevation. And low German is usually something that's spoken by older people these days, not so much by the young population. The standardization of the language has made Hochdeutsch the standard. But if you go to other German-speaking countries in particular, you are going to hear a lot of dialects that are not Hochdeutsch. For example, in Switzerland, Swiss German is extremely difficult for me. I will say that it's, it's not something that I can understand easily. It is something that is tough to understand, has no written standards, so it's really about just hearing that German. And at the end of the day, it is something that you do need extra exposure to do. But it can be very difficult sometimes to learn those dialects, especially if like Swiss German, they don't have a written standard. So what do you do? I think really Hochdeutsch is a good base for German, but then if you want to live in Switzerland, for example, you are going to need to pick up the local. It's different. And that's not just my opinion of somebody that's not fluent in German yet. Um, that is also something that I've heard from quite a few native German speakers, especially those, of course, those that haven't lived in Switzerland, right? Those that have simply traveled there often say, I can't understand this. And so it's not like other languages where you can get away with learning whatever variety you want. And then it's kind of like, okay, I'm okay. I can switch in between different accents. There's a few different words, etc. but it's fine. With German, oftentimes it's not fine because really the dialects are quite diverse. So if there's a certain dialect that you like, stick with it. I think Hochdeutsch is good because it's so universal. It's like the literally German, it's everywhere. Uh, it's something that is used in writing as opposed to some of the dialects. So it's a good place to start. But if you're interested in living or working in a particular country or, for example, the culture of a particular country and you're very specific about learning a certain dialect of German, I think it's good to have a lot of content from that country and maybe use VPN, maybe get a lot of local books, listen to a lot of local radio. I don't know. It's just very important to get a lot of that input if you want to, because it's not that easy to switch between dialects of German. So think carefully about what version you want to learn before you begin. And that was it. That was my German master guide. As always, I try to be responsive and to answer as many questions as you guys have. So let me know in the comments if I missed something you want me to talk about it. Usually in those videos, of course, I cannot cover everything about the language, 
but I try to make them as um, inclusive as possible and cover as many useful points as possible. Like and subscribe if you like the video, of course, and smash the notification bell so that you can see when I upload my next video. Thank you so much for watching this video to the very end. If you did, um, let me know what you thought of it. Let me know if you have any questions and I would love to see you guys here next week. So until then, bye-bye.